Grazie ragazzi, benvenuti, welcome to the last LinkedIn Live of this season 2023. I'm here together with Fabio Turco, our CEO from Piana Bicenza, you already know him from all the previous episodes. But today we're also joined here by Raquel Abalo, who's a professor of pharmacology at the University of Madrid. Thank you for being here. And we're really happy to be able to present you before the year ends, something which is published actually recently. Neurogastrocannabinology, and maybe give a little insight. I'm obviously happy to be taking your questions as well. But we wanted to just uh, go through and just give a little bit of explanation on what is neurogastrocannabinology today. So, Fabio, I'll leave it to you to give us a little bit of introduction on this. Yes, of course. Thank you, Viola, for uh, your presentation. Thank you, Raquel, for uh, being uh, here with us. And you. As you can see from the slides uh, on the screen, uh, me, Viola, and Raquel are the author of a recent published paper, paper on uh, medical cannabis and cannabinoids, talking about neurogastroenterology and uh, neurogastrocannabinology that uh, we this article we propose a new concept that is the concept of neurogastrocannabinology that is a new paradigm for studying and treating both gastrointestinal disorder as well as mood uh, disorders and the, the link between the two uh, can be represented by the endocannabinoid system indeed we know that uh, Via the gut brain axis, the gastrointestinal system is connected to the central nervous uh, system, and the endocannabinoid system plays a role in uh, this uh, connection. So, by uh, searching and studying the literature, we have seen that uh, it's possible to manipulate the gastrointestinal system. Uh, to have positive results uh, on mood disorders uh, such as anxiety and uh, disorders. And uh, conversely, we can act uh, on the, um, we can regulate the mood, and this can improve also gastrointestinal uh, disorders. So one of the key aspects in our, uh, in this article is the gut brain axis, gut brain axis that is the bidirectional interaction between uh, the gut and the brain and uh, this is what we explore in this paper thank you fabio actually can you give us like a slightly longer explanation of mm, what's a gut what's this communication between the gut and the brain why why especially so important that they communicate in human uh, physiology and then perhaps also in, in human pathophysiology uh, me? Uh, um, any anyone who wants to take <laughs> it, of course. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would like to thank you for your invitation to to be here with you today. Um, yeah. Well, um, there are several disorders or pathologies in which um, we already know that the problem is the connection between the gastrointestinal system and the brain. So first of all we have to think of, uh, there is actually this connection by the nerves and also hormones uh, that may uh, transmit information from the gut to the brain or from the brain to the gut. So I'm thinking, for example, in irritable bowel syndrome. In this disorder in particular, it is known from many years ago that um, for example, in preclinical studies, we can uh, develop models um, in which the um, disorder starts in the, gas, in the gut, in the gastrointestinal tract, for example, after in inflammation. Or we can also develop models in which the disorder starts um, because something happens in the brain, for example, after maternal separation. So this also happens in humans. Um, it is known that there is a post-inflammatory bowel uh, syndrome, uh, sorry, post, yes, post-infectious inf um, irritable bowel syndrome. And these people are going to develop the whole syndrome, the whole irritable bowel syndrome. And there are people who are, for example, um, who have um, uh, had a not very nice infancy, 
uh, who also have this kind of disorder when they are adults, young adults. So the connection is there. And when there is a problem in this connection, they, the, there can be both problems in the brain and problems in the gut. So what is going to do here, the endocannabinoid system, which is, I think, what we are trying to, to um, include in this paradigm. Well, it is also known for very long that uh, the endocannabinoid system has a big role in the, in the brain. Actually, the endocannabinoid receptors are the broader, um, the broadest. Um, uh, you can find them almost everywhere in the brain um, and also in the gastrointestinal tract. For example, motility is highly regulated by the endocannabinoid system. And um, again, in preclinical models, you can uh, use cannabinoids uh, to, uh, and that will provoke uh, a reduction in motility, constipation, and gastric emptying delay, and things like that. So the, all this, the system is there, both in the brain and in the gut. So it is just a question of how can they be um, modulated by other things. And I think this is when Fabio uh, could um, um, explain a little bit further uh, about this um, neurogastrocannabinology concept, which involves also the microbiota, which is the new, um, <coughs> the uh, new protagonist. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you, Raquel. Uh, as you were saying, uh, microbiota also plays uh, an important pivotal role in this gut-brain uh, interaction, interaction. Indeed, it has been uh, shown that uh, various uh, interventions that modify the microbiota can be uh, can have uh, results in the central nervous system and in this uh, modification also the endocannabinoid system is involved for example it has been uh, shown in uh, uh, animals that by administrating uh, probiotics such, uh, such as lactobacillus it's possible to modulate the endocannabinoid tone. In particular, it has been shown that uh, lactobacilli increase the expression of the CB2 receptors uh, uh, in the gut. Moreover, also other members of the endocannabinoid system, such as the palmitoyl ethanolamide and the enzyme uh, responsible of the degradation of the endocannabinoids can be modulated by the microbiota. Moreover, uh, it has been shown that, for example, a modification of the normal microbiota, uh, for example, what happens when there is a process called dysbiosis, that is a dysregulation of the composition of the microbiota, we, uh, the, the effect of this um, dysbiosis can be seen also in the central nervous system. Indeed, uh, when I was working at the University in Naples, Italy, I uh, published a paper in which we have shown that dysbiosis induced the mood alteration in mice, for, and they develop uh, anxiety and uh, depressive-like uh, behaviors. And this was linked to a change in the endocannabinoid uh, system. For example, we have shown that members of the TRPV1, TRPV1 receptor, as well as uh, um, PEA levels and uh, CB1 mRNA were modified by dysbiosis. And it was very interesting because by uh, uh, restoring a normal uh, uh, microbiota with the use of, uh, for example, probiotics, we used lactobacilli. All this change, uh, for uh, first things, the mood disorders uh, were improved. Uh, mice uh, were, was not showing uh, anxiety or uh, depressive-like behaviors. And also the levels of the tone of the endocannabinoid system was restored. So this is one of the main examples that we have in liter literature showing the uh, interaction between the endocannabinoid tone and the microbiota. And uh, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, this uh, modification reflects also in the how in how the uh, central nervous system uh, in interacts with the with the gut with the gastrointestinal uh, system. So, uh, this is why we propose this new concept of neurocannabinology uh, uh, because if uh, uh, dysbiosis can induce mood disorders such as anxiety. 
so it would be possible to treat this this biosis or this alteration in the normal gastrointestinal physiology and trying also to improve the mood disorders. And this can be done in both ways, because mm. also, as you, as Raquel was saying, there are a lot of uh, mood disorders, psychiatric uh, disorders uh, that are linked to gastrointestinal problems. Mm -hmm. Now we have seen that also neurodegenerative or neurological uh, problems such as uh, Parkinson or autism are linked to gastrointestinal and microbiota modification. So the link is very, very integrated, it's deep, it's present, and that's why we can uh, use and modulate the endocannabinoid system to improve both gastrointestinal and mood disorders. Yeah. Thank you, Fabio. That was uh, preceded by a few of my questions. I wanted to touch as well on something that Raquel now just mentioned on early stress during childhood, for example, and how that can induce uh, IBS-like symptoms. But we also seen on, at the same time that these same subjects also have lower levels of CB1 expression. So again, uh, reconnecting how these two worlds really um, also from an epigenetic level seems mm. to be highly connected. And I think it's really worth exploring whether um, some simple rescuing of these can be done in terms of, and here we, we talk about some potential treatments in a sense that can touch the these two worlds. Um, I don't know if any of you want to maybe touch on the topic of, we, we, we talked quite a lot in the paper on uh, palmitoyl etanolamide, for example, being a nutraceutic, being an endocannabinoid, and having this important role in uh, the shift of the microbiota as well. Uh, maybe Fabio, this is perhaps mm -hmm. one of yes. your <laughs> forte. Yes, uh, um, by uh, searching the liter literature, we have seen that, uh, for example, uh, PIA can increase the level of Ackermansia uh, mucinifila, which is uh, a commensal bacteria implicated in the process of uh, in obesity and also metabolic syndrome. So PIA, by increasing this kind of bacteria, can have positive effect, for example, uh, against uh, obesity. Moreover, PIA can change the inflammatory levels of the gut. It is related to uh, PIA usually interacts with the, the PPRs that are uh, mm -hmm. intracellular uh, receptor. And by doing this, it uh, decreases the release of uh, inflammatory cytokines. Moreover, also it uh, can interact with the serotonergic system. And all uh, this effect can induce basically a uh, reduction in the inflammatory states uh, of the, uh, the gut that is also linked to a decreased uh, 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 visceral uh, hypersensitivity. So also yeah. the visceral pain is decreased by using uh, PIA. So, for example, uh, also in this case, because some mood uh, alteration, mood problem can be related to gastrointestinal dysfunction, for example, PIA can be a useful tool also just not to treat gastrointestinal problem. We know that uh, the anti-inflammatory uh, property of PIA are useful for gastrointestinal problem. Uh, for example, in IBS, uh, irritable mm -hmm. bowel syndrome, PIA is uh, a useful uh, tool, is used in also in the clinical practice. But maybe also uh, by using it in uh, patients with mood disorder can be a good strategy because it restores the normal uh, First of all, the normal microbiota. It decreases the inflammatory state of the gut. So in this way, by the famous gut-brain axis, it can also induce some behavioral, not behavioral, but some changes in the central nervous system that can be useful in patients affected with the mood disorders. Yeah. <clears throat> And this, this, what is shown in this picture is one of uh, the paradigm that I was explained uh, before. Uh, we have seen, for example, that uh, changes in uh, microbiota composition that can be sh seen in uh, conditions such as IBS, IBD, dyspepsia, and obesity, uh, alter the tones of the endocannabinoid system. 
And this probably via the gut brain axis that is connected, the brain, the brain and the gut are connected probably or by or via the vagus nerve or via uh, circulating uh, metabolites. But this can affect uh, the central nervous system inducing more disorders. Conversely, if we have if we start by, from mood disorders such as mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, panic, post-traumatic stress disorders, there is an alteration of the end cannabinoid tone. And again, via the gut brain axis, this reflects in changes in microbiota composition that can induce some gastrointestinal uh, complication. Thank yeah, you. I, I think, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that I think it is very important to think of uh, human physiology as a whole. Um, it's integral. It's not, we tend to think of the gastrointestinal system, the brain, the lungs, the heart, but in the end, um, everything has to work properly. So at the moment, microbiota is involved. Uh, it's getting, to, we are getting to know how microbiota is involved in that many roles. In this particular case, it's so obvious to me and also for you. But um, it is, for example, obesity is, that's not a problem of the gastrointestinal system. And yet microbiota can help in obesity and the problems associated uh, in obesity with the gastrointestinal tract, for example, constipation again, or things like that. So yes, yes, I think it is very, very important to have the whole picture in mind. Yeah. Totally. I just wanted to add re-endorsing what you just said, uh, that not only the so-called uh, gut-brain axis in this case is the uh, main, main char um, character, but also the HPA axis and its interception with the endocannabinoid system. Uh, we did talk a little bit on and on the paper as well about this. Uh, um, some, some we cited before with the little sparkle around stress since uh, mm -hmm. HPA obviously has to do, uh, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis has to do with the regulation of our stress uh, uh, regulation and with the implication that this has on uh, our endocannabinoid um, tone because obviously it's kind of our buffer to stress in a sense mm -hmm. so once that uh, buffer it's uh, completely depleted at some point there will be some changes in the ecfs as well that will show uh, in terms of symptoms of some sort usually um we i think it's quite clear to anyone even not familiar with this with this conversation but they uh, anyone that has experienced a moment of pure fear knows that there are some changes in their um, intestinal tract mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> i don't i think it's yeah for example you have a talk or... and you get nervous and then you suddenly have to go to the toilet <laughs> for example yeah exactly. these things happen yeah exactly so uh, many of the things that we stated in this paper are not exactly um, groundbreaking in the sense of um, sometimes I feel like we, a lot of the work of science is kind of restate, especially when, when we work with plant or we look at plant uh, uh, interaction and how to, to use treatments, plant as treatment often seems to be kind of uh, going back to the understanding of the suggestions of our grandmothers and finding a scientific rationale for that in a sense and and so very welcome obviously i go back to the title in case uh, you mm -hmm. still haven't gone on pubmed and you want to have a longer reading on this but um really it's uh, nothing particularly groundbreaking it's just putting all the pieces together of what's been uh, the literature in this and uh, in, in the studies that i have been um, and have been done both in the direction of just looking at what type of changes can happen, for example, in the hippocampus, once there is a dysbiosis, uh, can we rescue it? I mean, I think was now uh, nowadays in, in Europe, at least, is, is a normal practice once we prescribe an antibiotic to always combine with that a mm. probiotic. But mm -hmm. years ago, it wasn't a normal practice. So we were literally sending people to experience this biosis. 
which on top of the pathology that probably they had, like the, the, the issue for which they were already taking anti antibiotics, probably wasn't like really the best for supporting the health of the person because obviously the, the system is under a major stress at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a sense of little tiny um, suggestions, but that, um, and, and this I would like to ask to perhaps uh, both of you, um, what can this paradigm, uh, how can this paradigm of neurogastrocannabinology, in a sense, how can it impact, have an impact in the clinical practice? And, and, and I will add on that beyond clinical practice, as we're talking as well about mood disorders, uh, perhaps we're talking about as well about a group of therapists that don't even usually make prescriptions, like uh, psychotherapists, for example. Um, could this type of work have an implication for this different category of from a gastroenterologist to a psychotherapist to a psychiatrist perhaps i don't know i i leave it open <laughs> i think so and um, <clears throat> regarding what we were discussing uh, we called neuro the, the paper neuro gastrocannabinology a novel paradigm and it is a novel paradigm and, and a novel approach but it is based on what you were saying before, on ancient knowledge, we, we can say, because uh, it's from long, long time. For example, Latin people used to say mens sana in corpore sano. Mm -hmm. That means mm -hmm. you need to have a good uh, mind to... Uh, it means a good mind is only when your body is good, is healthy. So it's their concept in the, from the past. Also, the fact uh, that Raquel was say that uh, for a certain point uh, uh, of time, uh, pharmacology and medicine focus just on uh, a little portion of uh, our body. And so we hyper-specialize ourselves just on teeny region, uh, but we forget the whole, the whole picture. Now there is a shift, a, a shift in not just in neurogastrocannabinology, but probably in all the pharmacology because uh, from uh, multiple levels and from various sources, I've, I'm seeing that uh, there is kind of uh, back, came back to the past because we are uh, now uh, considering the human, the body has a wall, and in this sense, the holistic approaches mm. are always more proposed. And uh, also, for example, the use of substances that are not just single molecules. I mean, the single molecules are effective, but also <laughs> a, a mixture, like in a plant, like in the cannabis plant, can be also useful. And coming back to your um, original question, Viola, I think it's worth considering this approach in uh, critical practice. Uh, for example, in a patient with uh, psychiatric or mood disorders that are always, uh, even 90% uh, of them are correlated with the GI dysfunction, it will be useful to, for example, to use or as a first line treatment, but I think uh, more as a, an approaching treatment, for example, the use of probiotic or a prebiotic. First things I think should be important, try to restore in the normal uh, microbiota and seeing what happens. Again, maybe uh, if we put this other picture is more uh, explicative. Again, uh, we can use uh, PIA or endocannabinoid like uh, molecules also to uh, uh, in, pa in patients with the mood disorders. And uh, conversely, in patients with uh, gastrointestinal problems that are related to mood disorder, we can uh, think to use uh, phytocannabinoids. For example, uh, THC has been shown also to interact with uh, both CBD, THC and CBD, but more, much more THC has been shown to interact with the uh, microbiota, restoring a normal uh, endocannabinoid uh, microbiota level. Moreover, uh, uh, because uh, THC reduce stress and also restoring the normal uh, microbiota has been shown to be involved in a reduction of the stress. It can be a good intervention to propose in the clinical uh, practice to use probiotics to, tra to treat uh, mood disorders uh, or phytocannabinoids to treat uh, gastrointestinal problems, especially when the comorbidities with, between gut mm. and uh, mood disorder are seen in uh, patients. 
Yeah, adding to that, I think um, that uh, microbiota um, provide modulation of microbiota provides also a good uh, opportunity to use uh, food wisely and to include um, some nutraceuticals, as you were saying just before, Viola. Um, these molecules that we didn't know that they were in our foods, um, but all of us know that some foods are better for us and not just because of the calories they, they've got, but because there are other uh, compounds in, in them that can be useful or beneficial for our health. So I think uh, PIA, for example, it's not just, um, it's, it's also found in many foods and we could um, um, take advantage of it. We could, um, sometimes it's difficult, um, especially if we want to prevent a problem to go directly to the drugs or maybe to some plants, but we can go to the foods. So I think the, the foods are going to modulate our microbiota. The, the good food is going to modulate it badly, but the good food, and we should find, uh, we should look for that good food, um, is going to modulate it for, for making us feel better. So I think this, for example, PIA is one of these examples that we, we should take advantage of. That uh, new, it's the, the foods, the molecules that are in our food, um, should be wisely selected and wisely used also, not only the, the drugs that we can buy uh, at a chemist or, or in other places. I think food is also important, and particularly for the microbiota, for the, for the, uh, the good of the microbiota. Okay, yeah, thank again, you. The whole lot, <laughs> we have to think of it. Yeah, completely, Absolutely. Yeah, completely agree you? with you. <laughs> Would you recommend us uh, a, a food rich in pia to add to our Christmas dinner? <laughs> uh, actually, for example, eggs have pia, and uh, I think some nuts. Uh, Beans also. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I mean, eggs, for example, for a certain time were like uh, something that you should eat only once or twice in a week, but. Mm, uh, because of the properties, for example, the anti hypertensive properties of the white, uh, of some molecules that are in the white, for example, now um, it is thought that um, this could be, uh, um, it shouldn't be eaten only once a week or twice a week, the eggs should be eaten more. So this could also be the case for the pia inside the eggs and other foods. So I think it is. It is interesting to bear it in mind, just in case. Yeah, totally. That would be helpful. Absolutely. And uh, to add on, I think on this list, I would recommend as well uh, probiotics and prebiotics. We don't just need to spend a lot of money in a pharmacy yeah. to yeah. buy them. I mean, a lot of foods, uh, fermented foods, especially things called the miso soup, uh, think tempeh, think... Uh, um kefir, kefir all of these things all of these things are, are fermented and are, and are a sauerkraut really good for your guts for yeah. your gut health so yeah i yes. think that compared with uh, you were talking about this is really ancient science and it is um there are many things that we have done for many years or centuries or millennia but we didn't know why so yeah. now it's the time to ask why and to actually um, disentangle the mechanisms of action. This is, I think this is our, our objective, our aim. So it is probably new from that point of view. Probably we already knew that some things were good for us. And now it is the time to un understand why. This is yeah. what we can do, the scientists. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say that nowadays integrative medicine is becoming more and more popular also in the Western like type of pharmacology. Uh, obviously, we have great examples in Chinese and uh, Indian medicine where uh, food, mind and body, they've never been separated um, mm. for thousands of years. So we, I guess, we're just reconnecting pieces that many mm. other people in the world were aware of. 
and mm-hmm. and of course applying our understanding which is perhaps a molecular understanding and and all of these uh, interesting pathways at least for us geeks so uh, if you want to uh, deep a little bit more into the paper as we are going at the end of this uh, live for today i invite you again to just check it out it's uh, open it's an open uh, source, so you can, you don't mean, there is no paywall. And uh, it, obviously, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, not only the session of today is over, and I would love to, uh, once again, say thank you to Raquel Abalo for being with us today. Uh, but also thank all of you for following us throughout every Tuesday for the past year, and every week learning something new about the endocannabinoid system and cannabis. So thank you so much for your support and obviously see you in 2024 for another year of this. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Ciao. Ciao.